applause for the amazing Kenny Mohammed, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're far too kind. Do I need to introduce myself? It's not that important for you to know who I am. I suppose. But I'm holding this microphone and I'm, uh, well, perhaps I should. I'm a janitor here at NYU Abu Dhabi. And as they say, I'm loving it. There were times when, <clears throat> when all this hyped up talk about creative economies and creative industries made me fear that I'd lose my job as a janitor. But I suppose everyone is more skeptical now. After all, what I do is creative too, even if it doesn't appear to be. Repetitive sprays of Windex mist, dizzying circular movements of cloth wipes like some sort of Morse code, and the teeth grinding, domestic drone sounds of rubber on tiles can all be sublimely melodic if you want them to be. <laughs> Now, allow me to tell you a little story. A little story about where my job title actually has its historical roots. Especially since we are nearing the end of the month of January. Actually, Genesis should get a paid holiday in January. And I'll tell you why. In Latin, Ianus was the word for archway or gateway, and also for the god of gates, doorways, and beginnings in general. As many school children know, our month, January, a month of beginnings, is named for that god. Latin, Iannator, the source of our word janitor, and ultimately also from Iannus, meant doorkeeper or gatekeeper, probably because Iannator was common in Latin records and documents. It was adopted into English, first being recorded in the sense doorkeeper around 1567. In an early quotation, St. Peter is called the janitor of heaven. The term can still mean doorkeeper, but as the term's usage evolved, janitor began to refer to a minor school official. Apparently, this position at times involved maintenance duties and doorkeeping. And the maintenance duty, duties took over the more exalted tasks, giving the position of janitor as we know it today. This janitor has been at it for years now. I've cleaned many a floor, many a door, many chairs, and what, I, what have you. <clears throat> 
while taking, a tip, uh, while, while taking peeps at the proceedings of contemporary art symposiums, as well as what they call panels and think tanks. Before coming here, I also, <clears throat> I've done the rounds at some of the world's most prestigious centers and museums for contemporary art. They all know me. They all know who I am, what I'm capable of, how I have kept these institutions respectable, spick and span, how, it can, <clears throat> how I can challenge them and sometimes beat them in the cockfights of criticality. They always have. During one particular event, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I get a little bit excited. During one particular event, I was, called, <clears throat> I was called in to do some quick cleaning in between one panel and the next, but I decided to stay on and follow as much of it as I could. And boy, was I in for, go for, in some, uh, and boy, was I in for some good stuff. Apparently, as I overheard from members of the audience, some of the panelists had worked together on different occasions. Some were artists, others were curators, while a few were labeled as theoreticians. This panel was supposed to be a kind of debate around problems in the field of contemporary art in a particular geopolitical region. And everyone who was anyone in that region's contemporary art context was up on that panel. Something smelled funny that morning, and it wasn't the smell of my carpet detergent. You see, the night before I had been appointed head, cure, head, head janitor, leading a small team of young janitors and together taking care of the janitorial responsibilities during the opening party for the grand international event which this panel was part of. It went on until 5 a.m. in the morning. It was verging on uncomfortable wild. Champagne by the gallon, food that could feed the people of a small island, <coughs> and then some. And people <laughs> were becoming increasingly aroused, if you know what I mean. The party continued into the wee hours of the morning. I had no idea what those panelists were doing up there. Almost all of them looked like they still hadn't recovered from their hangovers, jet lags, and morning after traumas. Obviously, all this took its toll, creating an air of negative tension and fidgety frustration. The debate started turning aggressive when one panelist started pointing his finger aimlessly at his colleagues, albeit very casually and without precision. What he was saying seemed to annoy a particular colleague, quote, the age when a few institutions and half a handful of people serve as the regional gatekeepers and key holders to the art of an entire region is drawing to a close, unquote. I was thinking, is this guy talking about curators or janitors? Gatekeepers? Of course, I knew what he was getting at. But still, it seemed a bit too soprano. A skeptical panelist replied in a flash, quote, we are all gatekeepers one way or another, unquote. Another member intervened with the comment, quote, you can't be complying complacency, can you? Only the complacent hell ideas of complacency into the air like that, unquote. The debate gradually turned into some sort of quasi-moralish, quasi quasi-artistic brawl. I closed my eyes for a few seconds, closing them for a few seconds, and could see an aged John Ruskin, misty ghost, with huge hands pulling strings attached to each of the panelists' mouths animating them while laughing a horribly insane laugh. Was I hallucinating? Time to freshen up. Thank <laughs> you. 
went to the restroom. It was white, so white that it hurt my eyes. Tiles, piled ceiling to the floor. The strangest tall white radiant marble I had ever seen. At the very back of this long rectangular space where the sinks were disproportionately tiny, where the sinks were disproportionately tiny considering the colossal mirrors that were fixed to the wall behind them, washing my face, I took notice of a little scribble. I took notice of a little scribble on the mirror's edge. It read two words, fuck you. I'm thinking, where have I seen or experienced this for this before? Deja vu? Am I trapped in a Spike Lee movie? I began to feel the whole of my mouth's muscular system bend downwards, to the left, to the right. I have lost all ability to control my lips. They have become autonomous, partial objects. Autonomous, partial objects taking control of me. I bend over to rest my weighty body on the weight of the tiny, pearl-shaped sink. I'm looking in the mirror, and I witness myself say, Fuck you and this whole art world and everyone in it. Fuck the gallerists who treat the artists like shit when they haven't sold the work by them in 16 months. Go suck someone else's blood, you fucking mosquitoes. Fuck the music museum education programmers. Fuck Reagan Thatcher worshippers treating out as some kind of eternal sin that we have to turn into good, stupid, enlightenment preachers. Go and live in Plato's fucking city, where you fucking belong. <laughs> Fuck the populace who keep saying they want to expand contemporary art to go beyond itself and its structures. First ask those whom you imagine you are doing this for if they want your fucking expansions. <laughs> Fuck the asceticizers. The aestheticizers who think they can bring back an era where art was pure beauty untouched by the political. This era never existed in the first place, fuckheads! Go and sell flowers, you jerks! Fuck the Middle Easterners! Fuck those Middle Easterners! Who build their uh, arty party careers on the social insecurity and instability of their people! presenting nothing but ignorance, moral contradictions, poverty, and sick psychology. <laughs> Guess what? We can't take your sick exhibitionism anymore. <laughs> Fuck the Africanists. <laughs> Fuck the Africanists. Who don't stop making the same exhibition over and over and over again with different titles. We understand. We do. The heart of darkness will always exist. Modernism existed in Africa ages ago. And yes, of course, Africans can be highly intellectual too. Fuck the former Eastern blockers with their muscle man cold theoretical jargon making shows that persuade us to feel good about their dead socialism and guilty about neo fucking liberalism. We got it, guys. We got it. And we've had fucking enough. Give us an alternative and we'll fucking dance for you. Fuck the new media wackos! Fuck the 
feel me gear my wackos to deliver nothing but meaningless gadget type cosmetic works and infuse them with the hope that technologies will somehow make mankind less idiotic. Try calling Steve Jobs for a fucking interview, you stinking hapless optimist. Fuck the goldsmithers. Fuck the goldsmithers. Fuck the goldsmithers and the teeny weeny pocket that bikini type. Newcomers to curating. Do us a favor, get a fucking life before you get a fucking curating job. And save the world your polluting air mileage because most of you are, are, are airheads anyway. Fuck this whole fucking stinky art world and everyone fucking in it. Let it burn. Let it crumble into nothingness. Let it get fucking erased off the face of this fucking planet. Strong headache type banging sensation. Eyes begin to refocus. Mouth begins to be less elastic. The voice, the voice has ended its mission with me. I feel drained. The last time I felt a need, an urge to pray was when I was 19. I feel I must pray for some strange and indescribable reason, but I don't. Instead, I leave the room and head back to the auditorium where the panel discussion is now nearing its end. Now all the panelists are cracking jokes together, giggling and laughing away. No code of conduct has been broken. No blood, symbolically speaking, has been drawn. These people, the voice went the whole nine yards, only for me to come out and have to look these people in the eye once more. The sound of their laughter created layer upon layer of steely echoes in my inner ear. It was clear to me it was clear to me, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time I realized this must be anxiety revealing itself strongly as the nomination of the real, to use Lacan's expression. Lacan, like any human being, was a jerk. But the guy had some pretty interesting ideas and observations. Kenny, my friend, you know what I, <clears throat> you know what I can just imagine him trying to do some psychoanalysis, trying to get, the bottom, get to the bottom of the roots of the art world's anxiety? Lacan was famously quoted as saying that anxiety was the sole affect which does not deceive. The sole affect which does not deceive. But on inspecting his art world patience, what would he have said? <laughs> These uh, patients uh, do not feel their anguish as an effect pointing out something of their obscure being to them. Anxiety does not open them to the unconscious. On the contrary, it takes the form of an asubjective experience which so overwhelms them that they can no longer recognize their own part in their situation. Crisis, criticality, 
Criticality Crisis Crisis again For criticality And criticality again For crisis On and on and on and on Criticality and crisis again. S'il vous plaît, mesdames et messieurs, chantez avec moi. Crisis, criticality, criticality, crisis, 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 criticality, criticality. Oh yes. These speeches do not feel, they do not understand, they cannot comprehend that anxiety is the way to approach what causes the failure of the fantasy. Thus, in psychoanalysis, we tend to see anxiety as a healthy function. A wake-up call to the subject who wants to continue sleeping in the arms of the pleasure principle. There is, however, a flip side to this useful aspect of anxiety. On the one hand, anxiety affects the subject, alerting him to his internal conflict, to his division from puissance. But on the other hand, it confronts him with the opaque and disturbing presence of a little piece of the real which puts him off sound and stops him naming the cause and the reason for his state. How do you defy and push ideas against an apparatus that is at a precipice that is sculpted from the material of its own arrogance? How do you do that? Why do you do that? When you yourself are a cog or a chip, albeit an irregular one in this apparatus. To live and breed in a symbolic system that promises openness, but which, it, but which is actually shutting things down. Trapped in, an in a disciplinary machine, I am looking for a space, maybe a symbolic space, a possibility in which to exercise my freedom, any kind of freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, Lacan considered the signifiers considered that signifies generate the world of <clears throat> the speaking being as a known world and that fantasy is produced to create an acceptable reality but where the cut of the signifier into the real opens out anxiety appears and the world becomes an unknown environment in other words anxiety is the instrument the mind uses to cut into the real, making what is seemingly extraordinary and unrecognizable appear to us. A cut is a space, and the space can be a cut. One must try to cut and create space. There are four types of acting, acting as in human actions, that can create cuts and spaces, but only one may have the ability to cut into the real.
FOXP2 is a gene that was identified by researchers in 2001 as the first to be directly linked to language ability. Minor mutations in this gene occurred 35,000 to 50,000 years ago, strongly suggesting that these changes were somehow related to the development of <coughs> complex language and, in turn, human evolution. <clears throat> For a large bulk of around 200,000 years, our planet was inhibited by two closely related but different species. The, the Neanderthal was in Europe, Western and Central Asia, and in Siberia, while sapiens lived in Africa. Only about 40,000 years ago, at the start of that last ice age, did Homo sapiens appear in Europe, meeting the longtime residents, the Neanderthal, who have now been extinct for around 25,000 years. Although there is no clear-cut scientific evidence, some scientists suggest that interbreeding or gene flow, aka sex, between modern humans and Neanderthals led to us having FOXP2 in common. If that's true, do you know what that means? It means that we can talk and that we have developed language as we know it today because two entirely different species found comfort in each other. This is both utterly beautiful as well as being the reason for most of our sorrows. Because it's the reason we developed this very limited signifying system called language. This is complexity itself, beyond the representation of its systems. But this is where I have found my cut, my space. There are four types of acting, i.e. human actions, that can create cuts and spaces, but only one may have the ability to cut in the real. Acting out is always staged for the other a display of symbolic challenge, one that accuses and refuses, but ultimately longs for immersion. It is a simulation of assimilation. Acting not is denial that any of this affects you. And, this by, <coughs> and by this very denial, it's exercising, presenting a continuum to the acting out scenario. Acting by is a mix of out and not. Acting in does not long for immersion. Attempts not to go into the rhetoric of accusing and refusing and is staged but without the other as the subconsciously imagined audience or spectator. Acting in might practice itself in another realm, a virtual realm, a realm of magic and phantasmological ideals, a realm containing all the possibilities of the world. It can find its breathing room in reservoirs that have been too difficult to exploit by culture, by the culture machine. It is a space sometimes illusional, but nonetheless as valid as the space of pragmatics. I sense that Ashil Goki had the rare ability to act in. He himself said, quote, I am not a man burdened by art, but necessarily doing what I must do. I am, therefore, not a tragic hero like Christ, but I am a man of fate, unquote. He also, he also said, quote, Abstraction allows man to see with his mind what he cannot see physically with his eyes, unquote. Thus, 
Gorky's special type of special type of abstraction was the instrument of anxiety his mind used to cut in the real and make the unexpected appear. Anxiety is not some romantic psychotic feeling on steroids that bodies into your mind con to confuse and destroy its potential. No matter what the conformists tell you, anxiety is possibility and percent potential. Don't believe them. They will turn you into someone else when you are gone. <laughs> In the summer of 1948, the painter Ashil Dorky entered his studio, barn in Sherman, Connecticut, tied the noose in a rope, choked the farewell message on a crate, and read, Goodbye, my loves, in broken English. His last act of communication before he hanged himself. He was 44 years, so, so young, and he had been affected by the most, of, most disastrous of unimaginable disasters that can befall a man. Cancer, the destruction of many of his works in a fire, nagging poverty, the betrayal of his wife, and the collapse of his family. His life had been a mass of insecurities right from the child, right from his childhood in Armenia, we had, where he had witnessed and he nearly been the victim of a terrible genocide when the Turks slaughtered the Armenians of northeastern Turkey. He was an immigrant, a nomad, a natural aristocrat, condemned to anguish by his pride and fastidiousness. He was also, beyond question, one of the most gifted artists ever to work, work in America, where he landed in 1920. No, ladies and gentlemen, don't believe them. They will turn you into someone else when you are gone. They will turn you into someone else when you are gone. This is a homage to someone the art world is greatly indebted to, whether they like it or not. I obviously don't. I am just an outsider, a janitor. My fellow citizens, I have recently been told that I am one of many who will be afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. Upon learning this news, my partner and I had decided whether as a private citizen we would keep this a private matter or whether we would make this news known in a public way. In the past, my partner suffered from cancer and I had my cancer surgeries. We found through our open disclosures we were able to raise public awareness. We were happy that as a result many more people underwent testing. They were tested in early stages and able to return to normal, <clears throat> normal healthy lives. So now we feel it is important to share it with you. In opening our hearts, we hope this might promote greater awareness of this condition. Perhaps it will encourage a clear understanding of the individuals and families who are affected by it. At the moment, I feel just fine. I intend to live the remainder of my years God gives me on this earth doing the things I have always done. I'll continue to share life's journey with my, my beloved partner and my family. I plan to enjoy the great outdoors and stay in touch with my friends and supporters. Unfortunately, as Al Alzheimer's disease progresses, the family often bears a heavy burden. I only wish there was, was some way I could spare my partner from this painful experience. When the time comes, I am confident that with your help, she will face it with faith and courage. In closing, let me thank you you, the people of this nation, for giving me the great honor of allowing me to serve as your president. 
when the Lord calls me home, whenever that may be, I will face it with the greatest love for this country of ours and eternal optimism for, the, for its future. I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. I now, I know that for this country there will always be a bright dawn ahead. Thank you, my friends. May God always bless you. Thank you, my friend. May God always bless you. Kenny Muhammad, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Give it up for Bassam. Bassam, yes. Make some noise. Thank you. Questions, anybody? Thank you for having us. It was a uh, really beautiful experience. Thank you, Kenny. Oh, it's an honor. It's an honor. <laughs> it's an honor. Let's give Bassam another round of applause. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Anybody have questions for Bassam? No? I guess not, huh? <laughs> No, this is actually the first time we work together. <clears throat> but uh, 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 Fox P2 is, uh, this is the second time I've done Fox P2, but it, it, was, a different, it was a completely different version. Uh, only a, a small part of it remained the same as the original. Uh, I, I tried to develop uh, the lectures in a context specific way. And this time uh, I have Kenny with me, which makes it extra super nice. <laughs> 